Yeah, it's like super dynamite stuff. It's really pretty amazing. And what's it for? Uh, I don't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> David from the Earth Medicine Institute. I am here with Brian Leto. Brian is a um, an instructor of ours. He's a plant chemist, a former alchemist, and um, an all around Renaissance man. So welcome, Brian. Thank you, David. So tell me, tell me about. I know you're you began as an artist, and now you're a plant chemist. How did that How did that transition work? Um. <clears throat> You know, when I when I was growing up, you know, my mom went back to school uh, to study veterinary medicine uh, in in the early '80s, uh, and you know, I was a kid, and she would take me to her biology classes and all this kind of thing, and I would sit in, and I had a really good aptitude for uh, technical terms, and and I liked I liked big words and things, um, <laughs> and so. So, you know, as a kid, I was answering a lot. I was able to answer a lot of the questions that the instructor would ask uh, mm. at 10 or 11 years old. And so this, this thing about uh, science has always been really uh, prevalent in my life. I grew up on a farm, and so I was pretty close to nature uh, all the time. Um, I also had a very, I guess you'd say, kind of spiritual bent. Uh, when I was a kid, I would go and, and dig these uh, kind of mini kivas uh, in the fields, uh, you know, probably about four feet deep. And I'd take a sheet of plywood and cover it with dirt. And I'd kind of bury myself in these things mm. uh, for, for quite a while and just meditate in the, in the little, in the hole uh -huh. uh, and kind of plant myself. And, um, and, you know, my family all kind of made jokes about it, but that was a really, um, that was a, a way as a child that I was really healing myself. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, art was really important to me. And I was always just kind of like I am now um, as a kid, just always working on projects uh, right. and kind of inventing things and making art and that kind of stuff. Um, when I got into university, I attended the Center for Creative Studies in Detroit. And I really fell in love with foundry work. Uh, and of course, you know, the, working with the metals uh, and, you know, in that state, I was pouring, uh, you know, every week I'd pour hundreds of pounds of bronze and hundreds of pounds of aluminum. Uh, and once in a while, we do really big iron pours uh, that were really spectacular and dramatic. And so that whole process of fire, I was very airy as a kid uh, and needed to kind of find my earth and fire uh, as a person. Uh, and I had moved from the farm. It was a very beautiful, idyllic, kind of, uh, kind of an, almost, I would say, an old style European farm uh -huh. um, uh, in Michigan. And then moving to the city was quite a, quite a culture shock. Okay. Uh, so, so that really, you know, that all kind of kickstarted this whole process of, uh, you know, getting involved with alchemy. Uh, and I was interested in a lot of uh, mythology and mysticism and the work of Carl Jung. Uh, and I got into the work of Rudolf Steiner uh, as a young person. Uh, and so that kind of path, uh, eventually when I moved to Maui, um, it really became uh, just this calling to look around in my environment and say, what's my medium as an artist? Uh, and I saw that it was plants. And I had already really been um, focused in out before, uh, but then there really wasn't things that I could take out of the environment in a sense of like, I didn't want to cut down uh, trees. Uh, I, there wasn't like stone that I felt that I should carve. Uh, there wasn't metals in the environment, those kinds of things. Uh, and when I looked, I said, okay, well, it's plants. Uh, and I need to develop a relationship to the plants and to the plant kingdom here. Uh, and I need to leave all that other stuff behind. And so that's really how it, how it kind of transformed in and of itself. That's fantastic. What did you need to heal as a kid? You said I needed to heal. Um, you know, I was, I was, I was a pretty sensitive kid. Um, you know, my, um, I was pretty wide open uh, to a lot of things, you know, uh, just when I look at myself as a child, I was very, 
just very big hearted and open hearted and really just kind of fresh and raw. Um, and there was, uh, um, uh, there's, there was quite a lot of conflict in, in the home, uh, like sibling rivalry and things like this. Uh, and then just really kind of not feeling, uh, not having this feeling of being, uh, like in my place in a sense, uh, you know, in, in my family and that kind of stuff, even though I felt super connected with the land, yeah. uh, I lived on. Uh, I actually didn't feel as con very well connected with my family, even though they're, uh, you know, they're amazing people and that kind of stuff, you know, but there was a feeling of alienation. Well, that, you know, when kids are that vulnerable, it's kind of a, res you know, the world would tend to kick the crap out of them, you know, that's kind of what happens, you know, kids that are that right. open. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's kind of the Parsifal story. Uh, <laughs> um, so, and you were, you were actually, so you lived in, I know you lived in Detroit for years, mm. and you were um, living in the ghetto, and you were teaching art to um, kids who were in jail, huh? Kids who were. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. What was that like? Um, yeah, I started teaching. I started teaching in the inner city. Uh, I was doing sets and props for TV commercials, uh, and I was building these kind of wild uh, parade floats for this Thanksgiving Day parade that happened every year. Uh, Macy's was on one channel, and our parade was on the other channel, uh, and it all just seemed really superficial. And I wanted to do uh, some kind of service in the community. Um, and once I set that intention, uh, a friend called me up uh, that was a teacher at um, a, an inner city charter school that was started by Waldorf teachers. Um, <clears throat> and so I started teaching uh, woodworking uh, and woodshop uh, and wood carving uh, to a group of inner city high school kids. And I did that for three years. Um, and then, uh, then taught at a Waldorf school proper. Um, that wasn't quite a good fit for me at the time. Uh, I went back to teaching in Waldorf school proper later. Uh, and there was a fellow who I had been really wanting to work with, uh, Douglas Gabriel, um, who was the head of all these adjudicated youth schools. And he's a really amazing individual. And so the opportunity came up to work with him it was just that I had, if I wanted to work with him, I had to go and teach in, in these prison schools or wow. teach in a prison school. Wow. And, uh, and so, yeah, it was a really, it was a really intense and interesting experience. Uh, I worked with uh, juvenile sex offenders, uh, which, which created a lot of, as you can imagine, created a lot of kind of inner conflict uh, and that I had to work through and understanding the shadow um, but I worked with, um, there were 80 kids in the, um, in the juvenile detention facility. Uh, it's, it was, it's maximum security. So I had to go through, uh, 22 electrically locked doors every day to get to my art room. And, <clears throat> and the kind of, you know, one thing that we work a lot with, uh, in, in Waldorf education is an understanding what we call the astral body. And it's kind of uh, the easiest way that I can say it is it's the body of connections between uh, people's place, people's people, places and things. Um, and, um, you know, a good way to think of it is, is uh, when lovers are in a quarrel, how they really repel each other. Uh, and there's a kind of force where they can't even be close to one another. Uh, but when they're in intimacy, their boundaries completely just dissolve. So if you imagine um, in the art room we had, it was another teacher uh, and myself, 10 of these kids uh, who had a lot of, I mean, they were really amazing. Uh, um, you know, all of them were really kind of very special people. Uh, a lot of them had a great deal of trauma uh, that they had to work through. Uh, and a lot of them were in fact victims themselves. Right. Uh, a lot of a lot of the shadows of life right and then we had um then we had uh four you know usually pretty big uh guards in that small room uh all at the same time so that psychic energy in the room was just huge i mean sometimes it was so thick you could just cut it with a knife i can imagine uh, 
and it was it was a lot of it was a lot of meditative practice really uh to be able to kind of find myself as a very open person a very empathetic person uh in that space in a way that i could actually be functional how many, uh, and how many how many um kids were in the room and how many and how big is the room uh the room was probably like 15 feet by 15 feet oh there were you know 10 kids in the room uh four pretty large prison guards and then two teachers uh, wow. because we all had to be in pairs for safety and that kind of thing. Wow. Um, and, and so, you know, it, just for safety's sake, you know, they couldn't have like sharp tools. We'd have to, if we handed out the pencils, uh, you know, uh, we had to count them at the end of the class to make sure we all got them all back and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and, you know, honestly, some of well, how should I put this? You know, the, when I talk about this kind of like psychic element with these young people, you know, the, the criminal mind, uh, if you can call it that, uh, really works so differently than most people. They're, so, they're working at such a high level of intuition uh, that, um, you know, oftentimes they're, they're largely in fight or flight right. and they're largely hypersensitive to one another. Right. right. Um, we would have kids. Um, I mean, there was there was one kid who was uh, one kid uh, who would um, he was like real serial killer kind of material, to be honest with you. Yeah. And he would be sitting next to the other kids and then the other kids would just like freak out next to him and just want to beat the crap out of the out of him because they could feel him feeling into them right right wow wow How one time i, I you know, we'd have to sign our signature on some of these these papers uh you know when we'd give them feedback and i he was sitting there like very <laughs> um very methodically tracing my name over and over again right and it was like, and the stuff that this kid had done was just, I like, I can't even repeat it. Yeah. Uh, it was really, really horrible. Um, and uh, and <clears throat> so then, you know, so th there were things like that. And there were these, these, these situations where within that shadow, uh, I could really see, you know, kind of the, like the exceptions to the rule of humanity, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, but we also like there was also a lot of um, a lot of really, really kind of what I would call sacred healing that happened in this place, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because I had another student who came in and, you know, he had been um, he was a sex offender um, and he uh, um, had. Uh, yeah, I won't go into what they did. It's actually very difficult for me to talk about. Yeah, yeah. Um, no need. but he had been traumatized when he was about seven years old. Uh -huh. And so you can see that, um, you can see in their development, uh, when somebody has been traumatized, uh, like that, um, they'll get stuck in their development. And so this kid was drawing pictures at first that were, uh, you know, probably, you know, the level of a seven year old. Yeah. Right. Um, and his writing was, you know, all of his letters were like two inches tall and he could barely hold the pencil, all this kind of stuff. Right. Um, and then and we would see this over and over again, where uh, um, where a person that had been traumatized. Once they had dealt with their trauma, that would be released and oftentimes they would then recapitulate all the developmental stages uh that they had been blocked through right. uh and so for example with this kid his handwriting went uh from like two inch letters uh down to teeny teeny tiny which happens a lot you know around uh around uh fourth or fifth grade uh you know kids will go through this uh where their letters sometimes just become teeny teeny tiny and then they sort of relax and get uh, normal and this kid went through this process uh, over the period of a month. It was very fast, and his drawings went from stick figures to creating the really the most 
uh, most beautiful detailed uh, um, renderings of Batman comic book panels. Wow. They were perfect in every detail. Wow. Absolutely perfect. And I watched this process go in, a, in about a month. So when uh, you were working with him, were you, were you, were you kind of, like, how did you, what approach, like, with him or with kids in general who've been traumatized and they were offenders, how did you approach them and how did you stay sane? How did you avoid getting sucked in and what, what was your approach with them? So a lot of it eventually, um, because you can't get in their space, right? So they, you know, we all have this kind of field, this bubble of personal space. Right. Uh, and and their, space, their personal space is huge, right? It's be, you know, because it's, a, it's both a defensive mechanism and right. all sorts of things. So you yeah. put a bunch of those kids in this really small room where they've actually, they're forced to like bring that personal space in uh, and they're all just kind of bouncing off each other. If you put yourself into that space, you're going to have reactions, right? And so what I had to really do is, uh, you know, follow the kind of the Taoist idea of doing by not doing. And so what I would do is kind of sit there, you know, holding my astral being in, and I would just be aware of what everybody was doing and what everybody needed at the, at the time. And if a kid needed a sharper pencil, uh, because sometimes if, if a kid, like if their pencil was dull, uh, they would start getting frustrated with what they were doing and kind of freak out, right? right, right. And so I, I would just kind of sit there and just observe without really looking at anyone, just out of my periphery. And you know, if a kid needed a pencil, uh, if a kid needed a pencil, uh, then uh, I, I would know that their pencil was dull and I would go and just quietly bring them a sharpened pencil and take the other pencil. pencil. And I would, uh, you know, just be an observer and kind of holding my own space. Uh, and, and that actually really worked. And when they needed You're to ask me a question or they wanted help, field, huh? you know, they, I let them come to me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, so it's just really about, you know, like visit the imprisoned, right? You know, that's, I think that's in the Beatitudes or something, right? Or like, you know, it's just about being present with them, not judging, not trying to fix anybody, uh, just being there and being right. a witness. And, 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 and seeing, you know, what, like what's coming or what's needed, you know? Like what's coming or what's needed, you know? Um, yeah, and, and so, so then it was really about, okay, you know, once that was kind of set, then it was about the teachable moments and just waiting for the teachable moments, right? Mm -hmm. When it was like, okay, I'm just, I'm waiting for this penny to drop and waiting for this kid to be open. Uh, and then that's when I'm going to say something, right? Yeah. And so I had to be very selective about what I said, how I said it, um, when I said it. Uh, and And then I could like, you know, these guys were very in tune uh, and, and really quite brilliant in a lot of ways. Yeah. Uh, they would win these amazing poetry contests all the time. And so it was such that, you know, like I could say one thing and make a real difference for someone. Wow. Wow. That's me. Yeah. How long did you do that for? Uh, two years. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Um, and now you're a plant chemist. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now I've kind of, I've, I've alchemized myself into a plant chemist. We were talking the other day about how um, I had been I had been referring to you as an alchemist and you had mentioned to me that you thought that was, um, uh, it's kind of an um, archaic term. Would you talk about that? Like, cause we, we had discussed well, how, why the idea of alchemy is based on something solid, but it's actually archaic. Yeah. You know, we've um, it's, it's something that, uh, how should I say this? It, it's all chemistry evolved out of, out of alchemy, right? right. Um, and I think that, you know, if we're talking, you know, uh, Richard Feynman talks about, you know, uh, 19th century science is 19th century science, 17th century science is 17th century science. Um, you know, 
everything is coming from these different perspectives and therefore getting different results. There's so much data uh, in this world, uh, you can't possibly deal with it all. Uh, and if you come from a certain place and you follow a certain path, uh, you're going to find a certain set of, of results and truths out of that. Um, and so, you know, as in, in looking at alchemy and the themes of alchemy, I find them incredibly valuable, uh, valuable, uh, but I'm not making, you know, the starry regulus of antimony here. Uh, right. What I'm really doing is um, something that I feel is uh, the science of, uh, of our day. Uh, and alchemy is, is, a, is a historical tradition that has, um, that I feel is actually valuable and I feel a lot is valuable in it. Um, but, you know, that's something that was from a time and mindset uh, that, you know, we've kind of evolved out of. Uh, right. and, and it's useful in the sense of there are a lot of truths that our mindset now can't see because we don't do something that alchemy does really well uh, in science. We don't do qualia very well, the qualities of things. Mm. Uh, and alchemy is very much based in qualia. It's all about the qualia of things, right? right? right. Um, and so just like, just like in ethnobotany, if you have a, a shaman working in the jungle, uh, he doesn't need to know about phenolic compounds and alkaloids and things like that. Um, he will um, look at these things as, as entities, as characters, he'll personify them uh, and those kinds of things and develop uh, a kind of spiritual relationship to them. Like, right. they would, like he would develop a relationship to another person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's well, all qualitative. It's pattern and that's all valuable. Yeah, it's all pattern recognition. And, and, and depending on which patterns you're looking for, you're going to get different uh results different data exactly yeah, yeah exactly yeah. so so that's kind of why i mean that's really why you know i draw a lot uh i, I draw a lot from alchemy i'd rather if i i don't like labels but if i had a label i would probably call myself a bio creative <laughs> um you know because i'm using uh alchemical themes and and uh and ideas i'm using artistic um, themes and ideas, uh, musical I themes and ideas. Um, I'm using whatever tools are actually available to me uh, to ask the question, what's going on here? What are we living in? Yeah. Uh, yeah. What, what, is, what is the matrix? How do I understand it? How do I, how do I become fully integrated into the, you know, the God matrix? Uh, and to me, I feel like um, those are uh, alchemical ideas of today. Right. Uh, well, and, and, you know, it's kind of like in spiral dynamics, each level includes the previous level. So we've got, we've got, you know, we have mystical and spiritual traditions. We've got alchemical traditions. We have traditions of psychology and physics and all these things, all these memes. And, and there were kind of like, I can see it, um, I was, I was actually just talking to Harriet Witt about this this morning, but I can see it being synthesized, you know? I can see all of like, everybody has one, it's like, it's like everybody has one piece that's valid from that perspective, you know? Including science, including like hardcore science. It's, it doesn't corner the market on reality, it's just one perspective. I mean, there's so much more to life than syllogisms and you know, and yeah, so we were talking about this too. Yeah, and you know, I think that's such an important point because what I feel like now is we're going into a stage where we've gained all this, these pieces of knowledge, right? Um, and, and that's kind of, the scientific method only allows you really to look at pieces. Exactly, exactly. And so we have all these kind of uh, disparate facts that, um, that have been agreed upon um, uh, but, you know, um, uh, they said there's a saying art appreciates, but science depreciates, right? Uh, you know, so it's like the science of the early 1900s were kind of right, uh, but it's not really a quantum or it's not really a clockwork universe. Now it's a quantum universe. Exactly. Uh, well, and, and so you know, scientists, they look, they're looking for 
their keys under the street light because that's where the light is, but that doesn't mean that's where their keys are. It just means yeah. that, you know, they're looking for data under street light because they can't look where there's no light. So, exactly, exactly. But much of what, what we do as human beings has nothing to do with that light. It has to do with everything else that science can't quantify because it's so bad at, at, at um, comprehending relationships. Yes, and that's exactly, we're all spokes of the wheel. Right. And once we really understand, you know, it's not about our individual ego, uh, it's about this big conversation. Right. Uh, and we're all spokes of the wheel and we're all finding these different parts. And in conversation, uh, you know, like what Harriet's bringing about, you know, the stars. Yeah. Uh, and okay, how is that related to microbiology? Because it is, right? Those archetypes, even in uh, those archetypes that are in astrology, I mean, those are 10,000 years old. Something doesn't last for 10,000 years yeah. if it doesn't have some truth in it. Exactly. Uh, and so then if we have these open-ended conversations, uh, you know, if, eventually we can start to really integrate yeah. all of these ideas and get a real picture of what we're existing in. And then we can really evolve uh, to the next level and really transcend to the next level. Uh, and I think that's what we're heading toward. And I think 2021 for me is, uh, is looking like it's gonna be a year of integration. Yeah. Right? We've gone through this big trauma so. uh, collectively. And now it's like, everything's kind of broken up. And now what are we gonna use? What tools are we gonna use to put it all back together and get a real sense for what's really going on here? And you know, one of the limitations that I see around that is that we're you you know we're using repurposed hardware. You know, our mm. this is all repurposed stuff. Evolutionary, you know, this, this sort of evolutionary vestiges that we're reusing, and and it doesn't always, you know, because I see I see everybody sort of doubling down on social media. The limbic system is like locked in. Like I'm right. Yeah. I know I'm right, and I know you're wrong. Yeah. You know, and one of the nice things about looking at things from all these different memes is that it kind of breaks that it kind of breaks that need to be right all the time or to be affirmed you know absolutely yeah and, I, and it really it's you know kind of lends itself to neuroplasticity doesn't it yeah right. you know in the, right. that kind of zen mind beginner's mind right. uh that you know and, and that's going to help us all uh to work with that repurposed hardware in aging right? Like learning new things all the time. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Right. It's like, it forces the brain to go like, ah, I don't know what the fuck is going on. I need to like make new connections. Yeah. Uh, and it keeps it fresh and, and really young. And being and, okay with not knowing it, which is embracing the mystery, right? It's just basically, uh, yeah. Right. Yeah, absolutely. The question, right. And, I, and, and, and you've been really good, uh, uh, in that, in modeling that, I really have to say that I appreciate that, is that uh, you are so knowledgeable and you're the, the first person to say, yeah, I don't know. And you're really comfortable with that. <laughs> and I, I, I love that because it's allowed me, it's given me, me permission to do that a bit more uh, right. and say, yeah, like, wow, okay, that's a great question. I'm not sure. I need to explore that. Yeah, uh, especially when it tweaks my hardware, uh, because when it when that when those questions come up and I'm like, ah, like, I really don't know. Um, those are really such a valuable, valuable explorations. Right. We're so we're also and you know, we, we we're like we're perpetual adolescents and we're always worried about what our nose picking peers are thinking about us, you know. Yeah, Which you is and I are perpetual adolescents. I don't know about everybody else. <laughs> but, you know, so it's like. And, and that, that social mirror is so critical, you know, it's just so critical for our, for our, our, our emotional health. And, you know, in the olden days, you know, a lone baboon's a dead baboon, right? In the olden days, when we were tribal, we had to get consensus with people. We had to be, we had to get them to like us. And we're babies. We have to get the parents to like us or we're dead. Yeah. But we're not in tribes anymore and we don't need that. That's not as necessary, you know, and, and we're running these old, actually it's kind of like old software. You know, replay. I agree. I agree. And I see a lot of that on this Island. And I, I think that it's, um, I think that there is something about being on an Island that has this kind of like undercurrent survival mode for people. Oh, uh, interesting. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know what I mean? It seems to have some kind of effect. It's like if you're if you're too weird here, right? Uh, like you can't kind of be too weird, even though there's a lot of weird people. All the weird people kind of want to think the same way, <laughs> you know. And it's like, and I I just kind of laugh. Uh, I laugh a lot um, because I'm like, uh, yeah, they're like, you can't be part of our our club, and I'm like, yeah, I'm not even close to being interested right. uh, i've got really high level people that i talk with that understand what i'm saying uh and i don't have to translate and that's cool like you, you know you're doing and, your thing uh, I'm doing my recognizing thing. that we don't have to I, you know it's funny i was i was um, listening to this thing about planet of the apes when they were filming planet of the apes you know there were people that were i guess chimps i don't remember the film and then there were apes and then there were humans you know and they all knew each other, you know, like, they, like I could be a human and my best friend's another actor who's an ape, but I would only sit with humans at lunch, you know? <laughs> While they were filming this, filming it. Yeah, they were, yeah, because when they were having lunch during the filming, they would only sit with the people with their costume on, you know? <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, that's pretty funny. That's pretty uh, funny. Very adolescent. Um, I'm going to switch. Um, topics here for a second mm -hmm. um so you were you were mentioning something about motherwort last time uh leonorus uh wasn't leonorus leonorus it was leonorus sibericus like, si oh sibericus or in the mm -hmm. but sibericus mm -hmm. huh mm -hmm. you were saying mm -hmm. it passes the blood-brain barrier yeah it's, uh it's, leonurine leonurine yeah and it's neuroprotective or is it does it work with myelin or do you know how that works you know, um, my I, I don't I'm I'm not super clear on its on its mechanism. I'll be honest. Uh, I know what I know of it is that uh, it's it's a neuro anti-inflammatory, um, and I've I've used it quite a bit. I've extracted it quite a bit, uh, and um, you know the work that I've been doing in the last few months uh, that I've been focused on. Uh, has kind of helped me take a kind of quantum leap in my understanding of phytochemistry and, and that kind of thing. And so some of these things that I've actually been working with for years, I, I really need to go back uh, and try to understand my experience of it uh, through a bit of a new lens. Uh, having said that... Can you explain that? So, uh, so what, what are the two memes that you're looking at? What was the old meme? What's the new meme? And how are you going to synthesize them? Yeah, so um, so in the last, uh, okay, let me just back up a step, a step. So for many, many years, actually since the Detroit days, um, uh, God, God, really it's been a theme since I even got into university. Um, uh, this theme of metamorphosis uh, and um, uh, this theme of metamorphosis has been huge, right? And understanding how everything is connected and how everything kind of transforms from one thing into another, right? And so I've looked at this with the skeletal system. Uh, I've looked at it uh, mathematically through uh, projective geometry and topology. Uh, and I, you know, I really worked this through. And uh, for a while, when I really started on the plant path, uh, I kind of had to set a lot of that stuff aside because I had a lot of catch up to do. Um, I had a lot of plants to work with firsthand because I really just wanted to work with them firsthand. Um, I, um, I had to learn, I had to learn organic chemistry. Uh, I had to learn the plant chemistry. I had to learn plant physiology. I had to learn bio, you know, biosynthetic you know, you new memes. You had to get rid of the old memes, all this stuff. Right. And so right. then finally, um, so you know, Siberian motherwort was something that I had found while I was harvesting uh, in a field uh, at a, on a friend's property. And I found a very small patch of it. And um, I had this experience with medicinal plants where they just shimmer for me, right? Um, and, um, and, and actually, if I can take a step back, the first real medicinal plant uh, that I found that I'm, I'm not going to talk too much about because um because it's it's problematic in certain ways um is that uh, uh i found a tree uh that in the in the jungle in huelo that was really calling to me mm -hmm. uh and and i had done work i'd done a lot of work in detroit working with 
uh, the anthroposophists and studying uh, uh, and working with elemental beings in nature. Um, and so I developed these kinds of uh, techniques uh, working with uh, Orlin Bishop, uh, a guy named Orlin Bishop, who is a, um, a, 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 a healer from Guyana, another guy, Marco Pogacnik, uh, who is um, a kind of uh, uh, earth healer, um, um, uh, works with elemental spirits and that kind of stuff. I think he's from, uh, from Yugoslavia. Um, and so I developed some of these techniques for intuiting uh, plant life. And so there was a tree that I had found there uh, that the root bark uh, was very high uh, in a certain type of, of uh, hallucinogen uh, that is like really changed my life, right? Uh, and it, I knew this plant had medicine. I could feel it calling to me. I did a bunch of research on it and then confirmed what my my intuitions were uh, and then yeah. you know and started started working with it and it really really just started to like open me up in whole new ways uh and i don't do a lot of these things i'll be honest with you um uh because the work itself uh the the plant chemistry work that i'm doing and the the study i'm doing actually is uh, a really grounded way to connect me with nature. Uh, and so these other things are tools, but they're not the thing, right? And they can, and if they're not grounded, they can lead to delusion. Um, and so, so with the Siberian motherwort, it was another plant. Um, and I had seen a bunch of, of daga uh, growing in a field and, and I was interested in the daga. Oh, wait, when so I, this on Maui that you saw the Siberian motherwort? Uh-huh, yeah. Okay. Got it, got it, cool. And, um, and when I saw this stuff, I was, it was such a beautiful plant. Um, it has these very um, APACA kind of, um, kind of uh, like fringy kind of leaves, has this beautiful um, flower, uh, uh, you know, the beautiful flower that's kind of like a, um, like a very small pea flower or like a salvia flower. Um, and really just, it just really rung to me. Uh, and so I found out what it was. I found out the, the constituents of it and, uh, and dieted with the plants uh, uh, for a week uh, where I didn't eat much, but you know, very simple food like brown rice yeah. uh, and, and just drank the extract of the plant uh, to really and you know. the motherwort? Yeah, I did this with the motherwort. Fantastic, well, hang on a second. Let me, I'm gonna see if I can sure. get it. An image of that. Um, hang on here for a second. Fantastic. Uh, yeah. I yeah. love that plant. Yeah. yeah that's amazing. No, she's so like, fuck, yeah, she's so beautiful. Oh. Uh, so, so yeah, so, um, so I, you know, I just worked with her, uh, worked with her in that way. Uh, and then I've been, I've been growing her ever since. Um, but honestly, the best, uh, I have a few patches where it grows really, really well. Uh, and I prefer to harvest it from those those patches, uh, you know, more so than what I what I can grow here. Uh, and that's it. Goes right right down the street from you too, by the uh, by Oski Field, you know, mm -hmm. on that yeah. that road that goes across. There's a whole there's a whole area like a paddock that is filled with that stuff. Yeah. So um, and that's actually where I, close to very close to where I originally found it. Oh yeah, yeah. So that's a good call. Um, but yeah, so so the leonurine is so interesting because it's one of the few anti-inflammatories that crosses the blood-brain barrier. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of studies are showing that uh, mental illness is actually a result of uh, brain inflammation. Right, 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 yeah. And it's in the inflammation, uh, you know, the, the oxidation, the inf inflammation is causing kind of short, short circuiting uh, in the brain. Uh, and so I think it's something that's probably pretty underutilized uh, that, that could be a really powerful medicine and a helpful plant medicine for people. You know, I, the ashwagandha is, is neuroprotective too. And it's it, because it's fat soluble, it can, you can put it in a nausea oil. It'll go into the, you know, but I wonder about, um, I wonder if you could use a, um, the Leonurus in a, um, like an atomizer, if it would penetrate the blood brain barrier, you know, as, as water, something water soluble. 
I'm, I'm, I would be willing to bet, yes, it's, it's definitely worth a, a solid try. It's so water soluble, in fact, uh, you, don't, you don't have to make a tea out of it to extract it. Uh, you can really just do a cold maceration Oh yeah, you understand um, that. That's right. That's right. Yeah, you, yeah. I mean, I I take this stuff. I put it in a quart jar, fill it with water, uh, put it in the fridge for about eight hours, uh, and then drain that off. Uh, and you can see the kind of um, uh, the water is just slightly cloudy. Right. Uh, when you do it. Um, and that's if you do it too long, nebulizer here, we can, we can play with that, uh, a nebulizer. We can play with that. Yeah. I would love right. to. Yeah. 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 Um, and if you have, if you have it too long, uh, you'll start extracting the bitters. Oh, because um, it's in water too long. Yeah. If it's in the two water too long, you'll start extracting the bitters. Um, and, and that's kind of the interesting thing with, with the mother wart. Uh, you know, it has a lot of like, um, cardio protective qualities. Right. Uh, but it's also that kind of gut brain connection. Uh, and so when you get the bitters, uh, like the, the Leonurian itself is just for the brain. But I think that the, the bitters likely also help some of the issues that are in the gut uh, that might be causing some of the inflammation in the first place. Yeah. And the, well, the thing with the bitters, too, is you need to taste them in order for it to affect the gut. So you can't like take a capsule as far as i know anyway that, that you need that's to very interesting tasted yeah because it, it causes a reflex arc to the brain and the, tells the brain to start upping the digestive game you know so that's that's all very interesting yeah but so I, there I again we have that here. as above so below connection right <laughs> right, right. <laughs> we're going to be talking about that's right what's um, got you excited these days brian what's what what are you <laughs> apocrine glands Abacrine glands. <laughs> Abacrine <What> glands, <laughs> mitochondria and plastids. Oh, like, wow. yeah, no, it's, it's funny because, you know, I, I think I've ruined a couple of relationships talking about chemistry. <laughs> like, <laughs> well, it's like Darwin's, Darwin's son once said to his, his, his maid, he said, what kind of barnacles does your daddy study? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, my daughter, I mean, she, you know, she's two and a half and she already knows quite a few plants when we go out into the, um, oh, into nature. Kids pick it up uh, so fast. They, they oh, it's so cool. Oh, yeah. She, so lo good. she loves saying Heshawu. <laughs> like I dug up a bunch of Heshawu and it's like for a week afterward, all she could say was Heshawu, Heshawu, Heshawu. Oh, we should, we should do some plant walks together. We could get her up and running in about three months. I think so. Oh, I think so. Yeah. Oh, and she's always talking about Uncle David too. She's like, "Where's Uncle David? Where's Uncle David?" Yeah. So. Well. Um, so yeah. So abacrine glands. So, what are, are abacrine glands? Uh, so. <clears throat> okay. So uh, in my class, in the course that I'm teaching, um, you know, we're focused on uh, these four main classes of plant compounds, right? Um, and we've and got. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, polysaccharides, mm -hmm. alkaloids, phenolics, and terpenoids. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to repeat that. Polysaccharides, alkaloids, um, uh, phenolics, and, uh, and terpenoids, uh -huh. right? Um, <clears throat> and so what I'm really excited about right now is that um, I started going into these uh, these compounds, uh, and I, you know, I've been looking at all this stuff for for years now, and looking at the biosynthetic pathways of them, and trying to get a grip on the larger themes that are going on in them. Um, you know, I'm I'm really approaching this as if uh, creation is an artist, and so that as an artist, helping me understand, you know, themes and light motif and all this kind of stuff is it's actually really helpful. Um, so um, in looking at this, I started asking these questions. I was like, okay, so where, um, what organs create phenolic compounds, right? So what organs in the plants create phenolic compounds? Uh, what organs in the human being uh, create phenolic compounds? Can you give us uh, an example of what a phenolic compound is or might be? <clears throat> yeah, um, a, really, uh, um, a really common one uh, is uh, CBD and THC. Okay. Uh, that's Got something it. that everybody knows about. And, right. um, and actually when I'm doing my introductory talk, uh, talks on these, th these things, 
uh, I use cannabis as a kind of model plant just because like it's it's really in the common language. Right. Uh, everybody knows everything about cannabis. Right. So it's really easy to, to then relate that to because otherwise the stuff is really foreign for people. Right, right, right. Um, so when we have those resins, the, um, you know, that sticky hash resin, uh, those are phenolic compounds. Okay. Uh, and they definitely tend toward being resinous, right? So where do they come from? They come from uh, glands uh, called trichomes, right? Mm -hmm. And lots of people have seen, <laughs> it's funny because it's, nice, it's actually nice because I can explain this stuff and I know that 50% of people know what a trichome is now. Uh, anybody that's, you know, like on Maui, <laughs> on Maui. <laughs> well, I just saw a study that during COVID, uh, um, 50% of, of people of the popul of the drinking population in the United States has, uh, replaced their, oh, wow. Their wow. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if it's actually true, yeah, yeah. um, but you know, but it's, it's interesting. So people yeah. are, are on top of it. So it's a great, it's a great lead in. It's a great gateway drug. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> to learning <laughs> learning medicinal plant chemistry sorry to laugh at my own jokes but um so so cbd as a resin or thc as a resin that's a phenolic compound so you have that coming out of um uh these glands these there, there are little hairs that emerge out of the leaf surface and out of the bud surface right and then at the top you have this little kind of blob of that resin Right, um, and it's doing that in part um, because it, it, it as a protective function, right? It's also creating terpenoids uh, that go along with it, and so everybody knows, like, oh yeah, you get the CBD and the THC, and you got your myrcene, and you've got your limonene, and all of these terpenoids uh, that you know make the bud really good and tasty, and all that kind of stuff, right? Uh -huh. And we also know that. Um, a lot of people know now about the entourage effect. What's that? The entourage effect is the, is the idea that you have the THC and the CBD, but then all these other terpenoids that are occurring with it uh, actually also affect the endocannabinoid system. Okay. Uh, that's, our, that's our innate system. That's almost like a, they're saying now it's almost like a second immune system or a second lymphatic system uh, that runs through the whole body. So the entourage effect is the idea that the CBD, THC, and these terpenoids are working synergistically together to create different effects than any of them would do on their own. Got it. Got it. So Brian, you were um, you were saying about um, the, the the your observations about how these um, these these chemicals uh, come out in plants and they come out the same way in the human body. Was that what you were? What mm -hmm. you were yeah, um, yeah, and so um, so in a uh, many plants uh, have these glands uh, that are resin glands uh, called trichomes, um, and these trichomes uh, are basically like a hair that grows out of the leaf surface, um, and often will exude. Uh, they're they're kind of like an an exocrine gland in that they're they're exuding. Uh, a certain type of plant compound. And so if you were to look under a microscope uh, at certain types of plants, actually many types of plants, and if you see these little hair structures, uh, you're going to see this little, you know, oftentimes you'll see a little blob of resin uh, that it's exuding on that, um, that surface, right? And those are phenolic compounds, right? Uh, and those phenolic compounds are, uh, are essentially evolved out of uh, phenylalanin uh, amino acid. And they huh. follow a very specific path pathway. In conjunction, pathway what we see in, in the are or, in the plant. OK, yeah. yeah. And in conjunction with that organ, in that, with that trichome, you also see the production of terpenoids, right? And those are terpenes. Those are these, most of the essential oils that we're dealing with. Uh, are some form of monoterpene. Uh, um, and I can get into what a monoterpene is in a terpenoid uh, in my course, but I'd like to just keep it simple. We'll just call them terpenoids. Okay. Because there are a lot of different classes of them. So, the, so you have 
um, you see this over and over again where you have these organs where the phenolic compound and the terpenoid uh, happens together, right? Now in the insect body, right? Uh, oh, okay, so let me, let me just step back. So I was talking about in the human body, where is this prevalent in the human body? Well, we have these apocrine glands, right? And what do they do? They produce things like pheromones uh, and, and, uh, and scent compounds and hormones. Oh. Uh, and these are the things that like, when you've got BO, uh, that's what you're creating. <laughs> right and it's the apocrine glands that are creating all those pheromones yeah uh, in very certain spots that are connected to your hair follicles uh -huh. right? Right, right and so right. we see a pretty direct correlation between these phenolic compounds and the terpenoids in the plant in this hair right. structure and so, the hair yeah. structures in the human being so right like we have our own trichomes we've got our own trichomes but um we actually see this um this same structural theme repeated over and over again throughout the human body. Mm. Uh, even the hypothalamus actually, um, uh, sorry, the, the pituitary gland um, actually has uh, of, of kind of this hair uh, with the almost what looks almost identical to the apocrine gland. Uh, and it's producing, um, it's producing uh, uh, hormones for the brain. Right, right. right. So it's right. in the same way, it's exocrine gland, right? Mm -hmm. And in the insect body, which is very interesting, um, how, does a how does an insect form its exoskeleton, right? Or a crab form its exoskeleton, same deal. It's got this hair structure, right? Mm -hmm. That's producing phenolic compounds. And so in, in, the, in the insect, it's overproducing the phenolic compounds, right? We produce more of the terpenoids and the and the pheromones and the, the hormones, right? Because they follow the same pathway. Mm -hmm. But in the insect, it's overproducing phenolic acid. And it also creates a, a, a polysaccharide called chitin. Right, 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 right. Yeah. And so that that phenolic acid is that it's producing from these glands is also interacting with that chitin and it hardens the shell of the insect. Right. 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 Um, so, you know, uh, we were talking a bit about the cicada and because right. I, I said, Hey, are there, are there insects that are used, uh, anywhere around the world as medicine? He said, yeah, Chinese have lots. Right. Um, and I, uh, I assumed that there would be because a lot of those phenolic compounds have medicinal qualities and they also occur in conjunction with terpenoids. Mm. And so that insect body uh, probably has a lot of insect bodies probably have medicinal qualities to right. as, as well as uh, food, as well as food value as well as food value right and so you can imagine what's happening in the insect body is like we sweat uh, we sweat and we stink and, and make all this kind of like uh, these terpenoids that are that are not quite a resin yet the yeah. um, insect body is taking that resin and overcharging that resin capacity and it's right. creating that hard shell and the trichome in the plant is exuding that resin that phenolic compound as well right it would be really interesting to find the snip or the dna sequence it's to see if it's the same in, in yeah that. my my guess is i you know i've, I've got a, a friend of mine who's a geneticist that i've been working with uh and uh we're gonna start actually looking at exactly that question yeah um, it, it, because it, it, the structure it, it, is so specific right. yeah. yeah and so so then it comes back to you know we have these archetypes in the plant cell uh of the mitochondria uh and the plastid and the plastid uh is um it which it's they're both interesting because they both incorporate it into the cell through lateral evolution they actually have their own genetic matrix. They're not part of the matrix of the plant cell or the human cell, right? right. right. Um, and so they actually came in later, probably because the other cell ate them and eventually right. they and just kind of lived in right. They just, yeah, right? one, yeah. And so, the, so if you look at them, the, um, uh, the mitochondria is uh, sort of a, the, the archetype of the exocrine gland. Like they look like kidneys for a reason, right? 
Um, and they're, what the product that they're exuding is ATP, mm. right? That's why they're the powerhouse of the cell. Mm. Uh, and the more ATP that they need to produce, the more little grooves are inside the mitochondria, right? right. So that theme of the mitochondria, the light motif of the mitochondria, we see recapitulated like all over the body. It'll be interesting to see if the, if that's um, if those are those dots are connectable, the shape of the and the shape of the kidneys. You know, I mean, because because mm -hmm. it could be just it's just like it could be you know confirmation bias, or it could be something that is actually built in. You know, that shape is built in. You know, yeah, and and it, it, it kind of goes to to. Um, you know, uh, it's like nature abhors a vacuum. Nature likes simplicity, right? Uh, and it kind of likes to use the same pattern over and over again right, in right. variation. Oh. And, you know, uh, Guy is very, very efficient, you know? I mean, incredibly efficient. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, there's, there's, not, there's not a whole lot in your body that's unnecessary. Right. 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 You, you know, we don't, you know, so. Very few uh, tendrils, you know, or what they say. They call it, yeah, anyway. Yeah. Right. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I would be willing to, you know, and so, so with this whole hair thing, um, you know, and I was, I was even thinking that, you know, if you looked evolutionarily, uh, you know, we look at uh, dinosaurs and, and, you know, a dinos the view of dinosaurs as these kind of big, cold blooded, slow moving lizards uh, of the early 1900s. And now they're, uh, you know, more intelligent, they were, they're young, they've got the feathers. Colorful. <laughs> totally, right? You know, and, and what, I, what I realized is, is that um, those, all those feathers on the dinosaurs uh, may have actually been glandular. Oh, interesting. interesting. Right? Uh, and maybe they were actually, if the dinosaurs didn't fly, why did they have feathers? Maybe they were actually producing toxins or pheromones. The pheromones, yeah, exactly, exactly. Right, yeah. you know, and so, and so until somebody actually uh, perhaps, you know, um, you know, they're, they're able to use kind of like x-ray microscopy uh, to look at the pigment sacs in the, um, uh, the, the feathers themselves on the dinosaurs. Huh? But what if you actually, uh, what if there was a way to analyze the rock material around that? Yeah, to maybe see they would see remnants of right. you know organic pheromones and yeah. toxins because right. wouldn't that be great if some big ass monster wants to come and eat you that you produced a kind of poison that you know well, would it, it ward them mate. off? Well, it needed to mate, and you have to. I mean, humans, you know, human reproduction is geared to pheromones too, and and sweat glands and males and all that stuff. So. Cool. And so we see the system, yeah, and so we can start to see the systems then, um, you know, where these uh, phenolic compounds like, uh, you know, um, uh, pine pollen is one, you know, and, and pollens are really high in uh, phytohormones often. Right. Yeah, pine pollen, uh, you know, right. right, exactly, yeah. And so you see that, that pathway of like phenolic compounds, resins, uh, sterols, steroids, you know, all that kind of stuff um, follows this kind of pathway. Yeah. And then we can start to understand um, and in a kind of system, systematic way uh, how the plants and how humans uh, are related and how these systems are gonna be related and understand like, oh, this is why this medicine is working on this, this whole system. Uh, this is why it's working on the heart this way. This is why it's working on the um, the liver this way and, you know, why it makes your ankle swell, right. <laughs> you know, so, uh, yeah. you know what I mean? So we can start to get these larger pictures uh, and start to have some predictive ability too yeah. uh, about That's some of these things. One of the mm -hmm. things I like about you is, is you're like me, you like to connect, you know, apples and bicycles and just see how they fit, you know, That's that's cool. Why not? Yeah. 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 See what, <laughs> what the overlap is. Well, Brian, that's great. This has been really interesting. Um, this is what we've decided this is going to be our first as above, so below episode. Um, any, any final thoughts about all this? No, I'm just looking forward to exploring it further with you. Uh, it's just really a privilege to, to be working with you. Yeah. Uh, and and it, you're so knowledgeable, it really actually makes it 
uh, easy for me to um, uh, kind of develop these systems and develop these structures and then run things by you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, for examples and, and things like that. So well, yeah, I really appreciate that. On tangent, so that's awesome, yeah. All right. Um, thank you so much. Oh, how can people get in touch? Oh, your classes. You have classes coming up and, um, and also how people can get in touch with you. Yeah, so, um, so I have this really great lab. Uh, let me just, okay. Uh, so I have a really great lab uh, set up here and it's the only lab I think like it, uh, you know, on the island of Maui and maybe in Hawaii uh, where I'm teaching classes and people can come and work with this stuff and experience it. Um, and important, uh, I'm a really big believer in citizen science uh, that, uh, you know, that we actually all need to be educated uh, and not just be uh, handed information without being able to develop the, the critical skills and actually see things firsthand for ourselves. Uh, so, um, so Monday nights I do a mycology class uh, where people learn how to grow uh, medicinal mushrooms for themselves. Uh, and then that's an introduction to a longer six week course uh, where people learn all of the uh, laboratory techniques uh, that are necessary for growing their own gourmet and medicinal mushrooms. Nice. Um, and then I'm also uh, uh, starting up a, a plant chemistry class uh, dealing with a lot of the stuff that we've, uh, we've talked about here, uh, but I'm a, I'm a big believer in practical work. And so most of it is actually based around different types of extraction techniques. Mm -hmm. uh, some more sophisticated and some uh, things that are uh, uh, able to be done with tools that most people will have in their home. Uh, and I've designed it to make it easy for people to get into this. Um, and uh, it comes out of an understanding of plant physiology and plant chemistry, right. uh, rather than just making, you know, say tinctures out of everything or making um, decoctions out of everything. Right. Uh, really looking at like, what, what do we really want to extract out of this plant? Yeah. And we don't want to isolate stuff, but we want to find ways that are most efficient for um, the compounds that we're really looking for. Yeah, optimizing the output. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And then you and I are going to be teaching a, uh, an online class on, uh, I think at the right now it's going to be on plant chemistry and uh, the immune system, I think, but that'll be probably coming up in the next six months or so. We'll have that online. So yeah, great. And how will people yeah. get in touch with you? Um, so they can follow me uh, on Instagram uh, at biotemple.hawaii. Uh -huh. uh, that's, that's a great place because I put a lot of really interesting content on there. Um, and uh, um, you can get uh, a taste for uh, what the work that I'm doing is about. Uh -huh. uh, I have some of my uh, kind of um, some of my artwork on there. Um, and then a lot of a uh, lot of interesting kind of thought experiments uh, and uh, perceptions about plants and, and those kinds of things. Right. Um, and then you can also uh, just email me directly at b-r-y-e-n-l-e-h-t-o at gmail.com. All right. I'll put uh, this video. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Great. Great. And, it, and just uh, I really appreciate when people reach out. Uh, I really like to talk to people. Uh, so please feel free to get in touch with me on Instagram and send me a, a, a um, direct message and introduce yourself. Fantastic. Thank you. And, and uh, for the Earth Medicine Institute, we have classes coming up. David Wei is doing a Qigong class. He's fantastic. He was uh, spent five years in a Taoist monastery in China. Wyoma is doing classes on African dance. She's amazing, amazing woman. Um, I, some of my plant medicine classes are up and uh, Ed Fell is doing a shadow work class and we've got oh, at least eight or nine or 10 more classes in the works. So stay tuned. That's earthmedicine.academy. All right, man. Thank you so much. Thanks, David. Have a great day. All right. Bye-bye.